in one of the examples we've got for you, I have a floppy disk here somewhere, we've got just a floppy disk. There's actually a couple of floppy disk images on the, on the DVD that uh, Dr. Burgell will get to you folks. One of them, and it's the one we're going to take some look at today and in our next class probably as well, is from the Certified Computer Examiner's Practical Exam. Now, this is not the one that's used in the exam. There's actually three that they use in their exam. This is the sample case. And it's, it's almost identical to the actual case that they use in the, in the exam itself. So this is something that someone would have to analyze to demonstrate that they knew forensics well enough to be an examiner, to be certified. In order to image it, and we, I chose a floppy drive first because it is using FAT, which we're going to use as an exemplar in the class, and also because for today it's easy enough to write protect this. What can I do to write protect this to prevent me from changing it? Just you just flip the switch so that it's open. That's it. So um, you're not going to need to do this step. I'm just demonstrating this for you for guys for the class. But um, in, in the DVD, we've already got it as an image. So it's just sitting in there in one of the samples. Now, by default, it's going to go and mount this thing. This is actually one of the challenges that we have when we deal with imaging systems. If you take a disk and you wire it onto your computer and you turn the computer on, what's your computer naturally going to try to do? It's going to try to access the thing. But I haven't done anything to it, right? So there's no changes, right? Not necessarily. Now, in this case, I happen to write protect the disk first. Again, write blockers will be pretty important. We'll spend some time with them next class. But uh, that was a floppy drive. What if this were a, a SATA drive? Is there like a little switch I just push and now it's right protected? That's a lot harder. If you just take a drive and you plug it into, let's say, a Windows system, not only is it going to access it and look to see if there's an auto run, it's actually going to go out and touch some things and start changing timestamps. That's a very big deal. So we want to have a write blocker of some kind between us and it. Normally, if I were using this Mac to do uh, file system forensics, I would have also turned off what's called the disk arbitration daemon. It's the thing that looks for volumes and mounts them up automatically. Let's just take a quick peek at this drive before we go any further, since it's already mounted. Uh, if we open it up here, you can see there's nothing to see. The drive is apparently, uh, is apparently blank. All right, no big deal. Instead of ejecting that, let me start up a, uh, a terminal window here. And uh, we're going to take a look at how we could image this thing. Now, first of all, since this thing is already mounted, if I go and try to work with it now, if I try to image it, it's going to tell me the device is busy because it's being mounted. It's being handled by the kernel right now. So rather than eject it, I'm going to actually tell it to unmount it. You can only do that as a root user here. And uh, by the way, much of the stuff that I'm going to demonstrate here is also documented in the book. There's some examples in there, okay? So if you'd missed something, let me know. I'll try to go back. I'll also make the videos available to you, so you'll have those as well. So let me unmount this volume, which will now give me the ability to, to work with it raw, as a raw device. Before I actually create the image of this thing, do the collection, I should probably do something so that I know what state it's in now. What we're looking for is to be able to demonstrate that our forensic process is forensically sound. What that would mean is that if there are any changes to this system, I can predict what they will be. Is it okay to make changes to evidence? It seems like, a, it feels like that shouldn't be okay, but now take it out of the digital world for just a minute. If you're talking about a physical crime scene here, you've got a shirt, there's blood on the shirt. You want to analyze the blood. What's the evidence? The evidence is the shirt and the blood stain. Are you going to have to do anything to that in order to analyze it? Well, it's already what? It is what it is, yeah, and that's part of what evidence is about, is demonstrating that it is what it is. But if I want to analyze that blood and find out whose DNA is in it, I'm going to have to take a little piece out of that shirt. Am I changing the evidence? I sure am. Is my procedure forensically sound? Have I demonstrated, do we have a chain of custody here that shows where we collected it from, who handled it, who checked it out? I'm cutting a piece out. I documented that I did it. There's a good reason I'm doing it. Sometimes you can't avoid changing the evidence. In digital forensics, if you're talking about a live system, that is an enormous problem because the system is changing while you're imaging it. If you have a dead system, however, there is no good reason to ever change it. 
I have a floppy disk here. There's no reason anything I should do is going to change this thing. So let me make sure I'm not changing it. Let me first see what status it's in. Now, normally, if you're talking about that shirt, what would the police perhaps do? What would the uh, uh, investigator do before he did anything to that shirt? Take a picture of it. Front and back, right? Label, all that stuff. That's that, that, um, the document. Ah, very good. Very good. So for the documentation for the chain of custody. Ah, okay. They can attack the chain of custody. Now, what I find most often is attorneys are not electronic savvy at all. Right. Which is interesting. I'll, I'll give you some things later on in the class, a couple of sessions from now, that... Uh, We'll kind of spin this whole thing around and make you wonder if digital forensics are even worth the time. And we're fortunate that defense attorneys have not figured these things out yet, so don't go tell them. Okay? <laughs> but uh, in terms of the chain of custody, with digital evidence, our chain of custody is a physical chain of custody document. We do exactly the same thing. So this disk, let's say this was a real disk seized from a crime scene. It would have come to me in an evidence bag with a chain of custody document on it. Would have been completely closed. I would now be signing off, I'm taking the thing, I'm opening it up, breaking the seal. When I'm finished with the thing, I'm going to put it back in the bag and seal it back up. It's still physical custody. So that has to be maintained. But I still want to demonstrate before I do anything with it that what I'm doing isn't changing. So here's the practice that you'd usually use. What we'll typically do is use a, a tool called DD. DD is a long time tool in the Unix world. Any of you guys kind of Unix people? Okay. So uh, DD, have you run across this before? I always like to ask classes, what does DD mean? And you know what, don't feel bad. I've only ever had one guy in 10 years, I've had one guy who's known what it stands for. Go ahead, take a guess. This duplicate. This duplicate, that's a common, common wrong guess. Yes, sorry. It's a, this dump, uh, data dump, I've gotten all these guesses. That's not it. You're never going to get it as long as you're in the Ds. It actually stands for convert and copy. CD stands for convert and copy, which you're, what? Where did that come from? Uh, what is CC used for in a Unix computer? C compiler. CC was already taken by the C compiler, so they just added one. So I'm not kidding you. That's really what it stands for. It stands for convert and copy. It's a very, very important tool. It's actually a fundamental tool in what's being done for digital forensics. As simple as it is, you can get all kinds of fancy things to wrap around this, but this is actually what's, what's happening to duplicate your drives. So DD is going to allow us to look at a raw device. So I'm going to tell it, I want to look at the input file of, well, where was this thing? It was on disk one. That's where my floppy drive happens to be. And what I want to do is uh, take a look at that as... Now, I can do some things to make this a little faster. One of the definitions that we're going to cover next week uh, has to do with the smallest size piece of data that you can actually work with on a drive. The smallest size piece of stuff you can handle is called a sector. You can manipulate bytes, but that's just an illusion. If you want to change a byte in a sector, that's all an illusion. What's really happening behind the scenes is you say, I want to change that byte. What's really happening is that the API is loading that sector, changing that byte, and then storing that sector back. Because a sector is the smallest thing it can handle. And absolutely the smallest sector size we use today is 512 bytes. Well, if the thing can only handle 512 bytes at a time, if it doesn't gain me anything to look at it byte by byte, why don't I look at this thing in terms of a block size of 512? Because that's the smallest thing you can read anyway. In other words, if I told it to read byte by byte, in order to read, it's actually going to be reading the same sector 512 times to get each of the bytes. Doesn't it make sense to just read it one time? So I'm going to set the block size to 512. Now if I just do that, it's going to read this thing in and just spew it across the screen. So that's not going to be particularly useful. What I can do with that is I can send it out through... MD5. Now the name of this tool will change depending on the operating system you have. In, uh, in OS X, the built-in tool is MD5. In almost every other Unix machine you'll find, it's MD5-SUM, MD5-SUM. 
what it'll do is take a data stream and create